the battle rages on as storm and tempest run we cannot win this fight inside a rebel morning. Good, 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 good. Are you guys ready to worship and praise our God this morning? Are you guys ready to sing praise? Are you guys ready to dance? Because our God is good, and he is awesome and amazing, and he is worthy of our praise. So let's lift it up this morning. Let's sing to him right now. nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. 
shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. He'll say, he will say of Yahweh, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails. Will not fail me now, you won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. And yes, I will lift you up 
In the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God is never late. He's working all things out. You're working all things out. And yes, I will lift you up in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. heavy all my days. Oh yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against me. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against I choose to praise To glorify, glorify the name of all names And nothing can stand against I choose to praise To glorify, glorify the name of all names And nothing can stand against And yes, I will lift you high In the lowest valley, yes, I Bless your name, oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I Would you guys take a few moments and greet each other, say hi to everybody that you'd like to say hi to? If there's somebody you don't know, then you should go and introduce yourselves, then you'll know each other. Give somebody a fist bump and an elbow bump from me. And everybody out there on the internet, I see you guys out there. We are so happy you're with us. Happy Sunday to you. All right, everybody. Hopefully you have said hello to everyone that you need to speak to. If not, don't worry. There will be time after the service for you all to catch up. But I have a few housekeeping things here for us all, and then we will get back to singing some more. So, first things first, the CF5K happened yesterday right here. Yeah, it was a good day, even though we uh, had to brave the weather and the rain and the winds. Uh, it was a good, good day. Uh, 
I got some dirty looks from people that were out on the course thinking that I was trying to kill them. Uh, but everybody survived, as far as I know. <laughs> and we're all the better for it. We're all, a lot of us are wearing our CF5K shirts today, so you see those red shirts. That's what they are. It's for the people that did the 5K yesterday. If you missed it, mark this time of year on your calendar for next year, because uh, we're going to probably do it again around this same time next year, and it's a good time. All right. Operation Christmas Child is still going on. Uh, they are in the middle of compiling everything and seeing what it is that they need. When they get that information, I will give it to you. Uh, but right now, what we, got, what we really would actually need your guys' help with right now is with postage. So uh, it takes $10 to send every single box, okay? So $10 a box. Uh, you do that math if we're doing, I don't know, 200, 300 boxes. You can do that math real quick and figure out that's a lot of money that we need, okay? So... If God lays it on your heart that you're able to help us uh, pay for that postage so we can send those boxes wherever God would like them to go so they can reach someone uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you go and talk to the people at that table out there in the lobby. Christy's over here. She's the one in charge of it. She's going to raise her hand so everyone knows who she is. That's her. Okay, talk to her. Okay. So if God lays it on your heart, make sure you go talk to them. All right. October is Covenant Renewal Month. The covenants are on the table in the lobby. I talked about this last week, so uh, take the time. Uh, when you have the opportunity, go ahead and read it and sign it before you leave. Today, for the people that are, are, uh, have gone through the membership classes and are looking to become members here at Cornerstone, today is the day for the Gold Letter Reception. Today at 4 p.m., make sure you are here because it's going to be a good time. We're going to have a lot of dessert and a lot of good discussion. We want to see you guys there. Ladies. The women's Bible study started this past week on Tuesday night at 7. Okay? Yeah, if you missed it, there was a good, there was a good, good crew there. Okay? But if you missed it, that's okay because it's happening every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. So come on out on Tuesday night and come out and join the ladies. The men are also here. So men, if you're looking for an opportunity to come and uh, do a Bible study with us, come on out at the same time, 7 p.m. on Tuesday nights. We are here. Okay, Saturday, October 14th is a work day. By the way, that's this coming Saturday is a work day here at Cornerstone. Okay, uh, what I said uh, to you last time is what we could really need is some strong men because what we're going to try and do is tackle that hill out back by the road so we could need a bunch of strong men to be able to handle that. However, that doesn't mean, ladies, you shouldn't come. I'm sure we will find a job for you, and many hands make light work. So come on out this Saturday and help us take care of the grounds here at Cornerstone. It begins at 8 a.m., so be here at 8 a.m. to start. And finally, Saturday, October 28th, is a very, very busy day here, okay? There's trunk or treat that begins at 3, goes to 5 p.m. There's a sign-up sheet on that middle table in the back for you to sign up to be a trunk, so make sure you sign up so that way we know that you are coming. After that, at 5 p.m., the Boy Scouts will be here, and they'll be doing a hot dog roast for us so we can have something to eat for dinner. And then at 6 p.m., Kendra Cross is having a concert right here in this room, so make sure you just mark off that entire afternoon and evening on October the 28th and be here with us and have a great time, okay? I believe Glenn has something he wants to say to you. Glenn, that yellow mic will probably need to turn on, uh, but please give your attention to Glenn. Good morning, my friends. Uh, October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and this Sunday is designated as Pastor Appreciation Sunday. As you know, we have an emeritus pastor, Dr. J. He's not here today, but he is one of our pastors, and also Peter and Paul. If you get a moment, stop and, and uh, let them know how much you appreciate what they do. They do a lot of work around here. They teach four or five classes a week. And if you've ever taught anything, it's not a five-minute job. It takes a lot of preparation. And uh, it's hard work. So uh, show them your love and appreciation. Uh, there was some cake over in the big room. Check that alley after the service. Get yourself a piece. And there's a basket on the table back there where the pictures are. If you have a card or something and you want to say something nice, put your card in that basket and they will get it. Thank you very much. Yeah, the mean cards we don't want. So, just the nice ones. 
I have one more announcement for you guys, and that is uh, this afternoon at 5.30, there, we are starting up the, uh, the Catch Me Up class. So for all those of you who uh, weren't able to go through the apologetics that we've been doing in spiritual growth groups the first time we went through it in the last uh, round of uh, spiritual growth groups, okay, that starts tonight for you guys to be able to, to get that and catch up with us uh, where we are. Uh, also, if you already went through it and you just like a refresher, you can still come on out and have a nice refresher course with us, okay? That starts tonight at 5.30, and it'll be happening on Sunday nights at 5.30 for however long it takes us to catch you guys back up. So there we go. Shall we stand up and sing some more? Let's do it.
Surely Yahweh will save you from the fowler's snare and from deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. If you make the Most High your dwelling place, even Yahweh who is our refuge, then no harm will befall you and no disaster will come near your tent. God will deliver you in times of trouble and honor you. When the waters rise, my hope is sure. When life falls apart, I stand secure. When my way is dark, your light breaks through. When I know who you dear, your word is true. Jesus, your love surrounds me. You're holding my life. You're holding my life. The Lord is my rock, and I won't be afraid, I won't be afraid, you're with me. The Lord is my rock, and I won't be afraid, I won't be afraid, you're with me. When the waters rise, my hope is sure. When life falls apart, I stand secure. Jesus, your love surrounds me. You're holding my life. You're holding my life. The Lord is my rock, and I won't be be afraid, you're with me, the Lord is my rock, and I won't be afraid, I won't be afraid, you're with me, you carry us, you rise above, you lift us up, oh God. afraid you're with me the lord is my rock and i won't be afraid i won't be afraid you're with me the lord is my rock and i won't be afraid i won't be afraid you're with me In a tale of the world, God, you lifted me out. God, you lifted me out. In a tale of the world, God, you lifted me out. God, you lifted me out. In a tale of Can I tell her?
Would you pray with me? Lord, we love you and we thank you for this time that you give us to worship here. Lord, Lord we thank you that you are our rock. That you are a solid foundation upon which we can stand. We put our hope in you. We put our trust in you. Because we know that you are good. That you are powerful. And that you are worthy of our praise and our trust. We love you, Lord. You are good and awesome. And we will thank you for everything that you've done for us and for just simply who you are. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I can see the waters raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear the sound of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. I can walk down this dark and painful road. I can face every fear of the unknown i can hear all god's children singing out we will not be overtaken we will not be overcome the same power that rose jesus from the grave the same power that commands the dead to wake lives in us lives in the same power that moves mountains when he speaks. The same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us. Lives in us. He lives in us. Lives in us. We have hope that his promises are true in his strength. There is nothing we can't do. Yes, we know there are greater things in store. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave. The same power that commands the dead to wake. Lives in us. Lives in us. The same The same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us, lives in us. He lives in us, lives in us. Greater is He that is living in me. He's conquered our enemy. No power of darkness, no weapon prevails. We sit here in victory. Oh, greater is He that is living in me. He's conquered our enemy. Oh, no power of darkness, no weapon prevails. We sit here in victory. In victory. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to wake, lives in us, lives in us. The same power that moves down is when he speaks, the same power that can come a agency, lives in us. going to move forward in our worship service to the most important thing we do every time we come together, the reading of God's Word. It's going to be found in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 1 to 11. I'm going to read it to you this morning, so turn there in your Bibles. Okay, remember, this is not just words on a page. 
This is God in this room right here, right now, talking to you. So treat it just like that. All conversations, whether they're in this room, whether they're in the lobby, should cease right now. And so if there's a conversation going on in the lobby, we need to tell it to stop. That's me giving direction to our ushers. If there's a conversation in the lobby, it needs to stop right now. We are reading God's word. He is talking to us right now. He needs our attention. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 1 to 11 says, Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp in Ephes Demim between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley in between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight me and kill me, we'll become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become ours and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. And since I missed this before, God is good. And all the time, turn your light on. Thank you, Paul. Kids are on their way to Cool Kids. The back screen took the message away, so I can't tell you who's supposed to be watching the kids, but someone's back there. Ah, there it is. It's Tony and Erica. <laughs> They're waiting for you at the door. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us to your house today. We thank you for the gift of your word. And we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to hear what you have to say to us, that you would get the preacher out of, your, out of the way and talk to your people. Uh, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Is there anybody who's still sore from the 5K? Doing, doing, doing this, this walk. Terry's doing it as she walks out of the room right now. <laughs> well, today we are going to, to cover, we're going to come to one of the most well-known stories in the entire Bible. Today we're going to begin a story that uh, almost everybody has some familiarity with. In fact, even people who are not familiar with church or the Bible usually have some exposure to this story and it is a good story. It is a real David and Goliath story. It is, in fact, the story of David and Goliath. You, you know these names, right? You've heard this before. You're paying attention to me. Okay, I, that, wasn't, that wasn't giving me a lot of confidence there. Uh, I know that this is a familiar story. And I know that when we deal with familiar stories, often we are tempted to think that we know it all, we've heard it all before, and then what we do when we, when we cover it in the sermon is we zone out and we pay less attention because we think we've got it all figured out. We know it all. There's nothing new for me in this story. I have heard this over the years. I don't know how many times from children, from youth, from adults, all alike. We've heard this one before. We know all about it. Well, let me tell you right now. Don't zone out as we deal with the story of David and Goliath because it's a familiar story, because there are lessons for you in this story, and you have not heard it all before. Through the Holy Spirit, God is able to teach you new things every time you read the Scripture, no matter how many times you've read that section before. The Bible tells us that all Scripture is theonistos. That means it is God-breathed. And since it is God-breathed, breathed out by God, you can always learn from it. 
It is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness so that the follower of God can be fully equipped for every good work. So right now, as we begin the story of David and Goliath, put away the, I've heard that before, and hear what God has for you this time. And in addition to that, we are not going to cover this well-known story in one big blast. We're going to break it up, and we're going to cover it over, for, over a few weeks. So put away the, I've heard it before, for a few weeks. And what we're going to do in doing so, in breaking it up, we're going to be able to pick out lessons from within the story that apply to us today in our lives that we might have missed otherwise, and then we can learn them. So today... We begin the story, and it says in verse 1, Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sokoh in Judah. They pitched camp camp at Ephes Damim between Sokoh and Azekah. Saul Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. So, once again, the Philistines are back. Now, you'll remember that the king's son, Jonathan, had attacked the Philistine army without the rest of the Israelite army, without the rest of the human army, because the Israelite army had no weapons, and it seemed that Jonathan was moving without military support. But when Jonathan attacked the Philistines, trusting that God could step in and do a great thing if God wanted to, what happened was God did step in and deliver. God sent an earthquake. And he sent the armies of heaven to aid Jonathan. And the Philistines began attacking each other, and they retreated. And then the Israelite army finally got their act together and joined in the pursuit and the rout of the Philistines. However, King Saul was more concerned with getting his own revenge on the Philistines for himself and made the men make a stupid oath. And it all ended up with the king intending to kill his own son. But the men of the army wouldn't let that happen. They stepped in and said that Jonathan was the hero of the day. He was the one who God had acted through to save Israel, so they wouldn't let the king kill Jonathan. But because of all the conflict within the Israelite ranks, the Philistines got away. And now they're back. And just like in the previous battle, in the war between the Philistines and the Israelites, the battle lines are drawn up, and the armies are on opposite hills, and the valley in which the battle is sure to take place is between them. And both armies are sitting there, waiting, waiting in the great deep breath, the silent pause before the bloodshed would begin. Now, the last time this happened, the Philistines were so confident in their victory that they didn't even pay attention to the Israelite army that was hiding in the trees. And instead, they sent out raiding parties against all the surrounding Israelite towns, not even caring what the Israelite army was going to do. Right up until the point that they were ambushed by Jonathan and the mighty arm of God. This time, they ain't going to make that same mistake again. They're not going to neglect the Israelite army This time, they're going to confront the Israelites directly. Verse 4 says, A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. So Goliath steps forward from the the battle lines of the Philistines. He was from the city of Gath, and he was a monstrous man. The Bible says he is six cubits and a span tall, over nine feet tall. Now, this is impossibly large for us. In fact, it is difficult for us to even get into or wrap our minds around how large a person nine feet tall is. The the tallest men in this room 
would top out at no more than six foot six. Nearly three feet, a full yardstick shorter than Goliath. A few years ago, during our upward basketball season, uh, we had a man visit the practices of our upward teams and talk to the kids who had previously pr played professional basketball in one of the NBA's under leagues. And he was six foot ten, which is impossibly big. Standing next to a man who is six foot ten, you feel like a child. As he talked to the kids at the basketball practice, he casually reached up and took hold of the basketball net and stood there talking to them, holding the net, which a lot of people can't jump and touch. But even he was still more than two feet shorter than Goliath. This Philistine man was a giant. Now, history reveals to us that Although Goliath's size is unusual, it is certainly not unheard of. Historical writers like Herodotus and Pliny mention men approaching or surpassing seven cubits in height, more than ten feet tall. The largest man alive today is eight foot three, and according to the Guinness Book of World Records, the tallest man who ever is recorded living is Robert Wadlow, who was eight foot eleven when he died at the age of 22 in 1940. But history and the Bible tell us that Wadlow was not the tallest man in history. Goliath had Robert Wadlow beat. The Bible indicates to us that before the flood, people lived longer and grew larger than they do today. See my creation class if you want more detail on that. And in some cases and in some family lines, the tendency to grow larger continued after the flood. A certain family line, the Anakites, who happened to be from the city of Gath, Goliath's own town, were known to be exceptionally large human beings. And Goliath, this massive man, stepped forward, and Israel had nobody who was larger than everybody else to match Goliath. Nobody bigger than everybody else. Hold on to that thought for a minute. Because Goliath was not just a huge man, he was also arrayed in full battle armor, weighing 150 to 200 pounds, just the armor. So he was not just massively tall, he was also massively strong. Strong enough to carry the weight of, a full ar of the full armor for someone his size, armor weighing more than twice what the normal armor of a normal person would weigh at that time. The point of his spear alone weighed around 15 pounds. A normal spear point weighs about 1 to 4 pounds. He carried a spear point heavier than any sledgehammer a normal person uses today. That was just the point of the weapon. The entire weapon itself weighed 30 pounds. And that was just one of his weapons. He had a massive javelin for throwing on his back. He had a sword. Both of those weapons were also just as oversized as his spear was. He was a tank of a man. Huge. Massively strong. Armored. Equipped for battle. He was a fearsome sight. And at the very end of that section, the Bible gives us a detail that we often skip. The Bible says his shield bearer went forward with him. And when the Bible presents that, you have to realize that the shield bearer also must have been no joke of a human being. I mean, he isn't described as being exceptionally large here, but, you know, like Goliath is, but if you're standing next to a nine foot tall person, how big do you look? But his job was to carry Goliath's massive equipment and help the huge man suit up for battle. To carry and to hold all the massive weapons that he wasn't using at any given time. So even Goliath's armor bearer must have been a formidably strong, huge, fit, muscular man to carry around all that equipment. Goliath is a threat of his own, but even his shield bearer probably was, you know, think Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime. Incredibly muscled and fit. 
And he's just the guy who carries the tools for the big guy. And the Bible calls Goliath a champion. And in this case, the word champion really comes from the Hebrew word that means middleman, or a man between the two. Because what is going on here is what is known as champion warfare. It is a well-known historical type of combat in which each side picks a middleman, a champion. And that man stands between the two armies and fights as a representative of his army. And whoever wins is the side that wins the battle. So when this massive man stepped forward, the Israelites knew exactly what was going on. It was a challenge to single combat with somebody from the Israelite army, and whoever won was going to be the victor of the battle. It was an approach to warfare that was considered more civilized. Because instead of thousands of men dying on both sides, maybe only one man needed to die to settle the battle. More civilized warfare. Sure. And champion warfare is a fairly common practice in the ancient world, or was a common practice in the ancient world. In, first, in 2 Samuel, we're going to see another example of this from the Bible between Abner's men and Joab's men. It occurs several times in Homer's Iliad, which contains probably the most famous example of champion combat besides the story of David and Goliath, the battle of Hector and Achilles in front of the gates of the city of Troy. So the Israelites knew exactly what was going on when massive Goliath stepped forward. But just to make the case clear, verse 8, Goliath stood and shouted at the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we'll become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. So Goliath shouts at the Israelite army. He proposed champion battle. And the, the champions would decide the conflict. The winner of the battle between the two would be the victorious side, and whoever lost would become the slaves of the other side. And this is a somewhat odd thing to happen here. Because the Philistines have the superior military force. They have better weapons, they have more men. And it is odd for the superior military side to propose champion combat because you could just overwhelm the enemy by his sheer force of numbers. But the last time the Philistines fought the Israelites, they had had the numerical advantage then too. And that didn't end up so well for them. So perhaps here we see the Philistines attempting to rule out any supernatural assistance that the Israelites might have received like last time. Or maybe they just know that their champion is completely undefeatable. No one could defeat a warrior of that size and that skill. And the Bible says in verse 11, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. The Israelites are dismayed and terrified. This means that they lost all hope. They saw that they could not match Goliath. They were completely defeated before the battle even begun. They were dismayed and terrified because of what was going to happen. Because they had already concluded that there was no chance of victory. And let's be clear, that was the Philistines' intention. That was what Goliath wanted to happen by issuing the challenge to champion combat. It's why he stepped forward where everybody could see how big he was and how massive his weapons were. He wanted the Israelites to be scared. He didn't even have to fight them. He had defeated the Israelite army with fear alone. Now, this strategy is sound. To demoralize your opponent and strike fear into their heart. It's a good strategy. It reminds me of one of the greatest sports movies of all times. Little Giants. 
Now, I am not a Giants fan, but any movie where the Cowboys are the bad guys is okay in my book. And in The Little Giants, they learn from some NFL greats that football is 80% mental and 40% physical. And that what they needed to do to the other team on game day was intimidate their opponent. If you demoralize your enemy, fear might stop them from even beginning to fight. But if they do begin, they'll be unsure. And they won't just be fighting you, they'll be fighting apprehension and fear at the same time. And you have the advantage. Mickey taught, the, taught, taught us this in Rocky. That intimidation or a good snarl gives you what the Bible calls a psychological edge. That's what Goliath had done. The battle was over before the other side had even begun to fight. That is the power of fear. And if you notice there in verse 11, Saul is singled out. It says Saul and all the Israelites because Saul had a special reason to be afraid. He was the commander of the Israelite army. So if no champion was found, it would be on him to fight Goliath. And it looked like they weren't going to be able to find a champion because none of the Israelites could match Goliath, right? There was no one in the Israelite camp who was bigger than everybody else, right? There was no one in the Israelite camp who was a head taller than the rest, right? Oh, wait. When they brought Saul out from hiding in the luggage a couple chapters ago, back in 1 Samuel chapter 10, it said, verse 23, as he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. Saul was the largest man in the Israelite army a head taller than all the others. Now, he wasn't as big as Goliath, but as the leader of the army and as the tallest man, Saul was the logical choice to fight Goliath. And Saul knew it. And it's reasonable to think that at least some of the men in the Israelite army assumed that Saul should be the one to go fight Goliath. Being tall was one of the key things that made them think he would be a good king. But Saul was Saul. He wasn't godly. He didn't trust God. And even worse, now the Holy Spirit had left him. So Saul is dismayed and terrified. Like the rest of the Israelite army, Saul was defeated before the battle had even begun. You know me well enough to know that I won't let this just be about Saul and the Israelites. It's about us too. It's why God has preserved his word down through history so that we can read it today. It isn't just to read what happened back then and, and know history. God has given us the Bible so that we can be aided in becoming more and more the people we should be in him. And we're going to stop the story right here. And I bet if you've heard the story of David and Goliath a hundred times in your life, you've never heard the story stop right here. So we're gonna. We're only gonna go far this week. We're gonna stop with Goliath shouting the challenge to the Israelites and all of them, especially Saul, being dismayed and terrified. And we're gonna stop right there because fear is a key strategy that the enemy uses against us in our lives. In the battle of good versus evil, heaven versus hell, God versus Satan, the victor has already been decided. The victory is secure. It was won for us by our champion in champion combat. The champions were chosen, and Satan used all the power he had he pushed the sin, sin of all the world and all the accusations that went along with it onto our champion. And he was killed for our wrongdoing. He was slain to pay the price for what we did wrong. And just as Satan began to celebrate the victory and come to make us his slaves, Jesus, our champion, 
burst out of the grave. He won the victory once for all, and our champion stands victorious. The battle had already, has already been won, and Satan knows it. If we fight with God on our side, we win. If God is for us, who can be against us? No one. But, but, if you've already lost a battle, how do you still inflict losses on the other side? Fear. One of Satan's strategies is to intimidate us, just like Goliath intimidated the Israelites, so much so that we don't even step onto the battlefield. If he can get us to be dismayed and terrified, we defeat ourselves, just like the Israelites did. We become paralyzed, and we don't do what we should do. And obviously, the solution to this is to trust God and to step onto the battlefield. But Satan wants you to be afraid to serve God. He wants to use fear to whisper in your ear and get your eyes off of how big God is and instead focus on how big the giant is. Satan loves to turn faith into fear by shifting our focus and whispering the voice of fear into our ear. And the voice of fear comes at us in so many different ways. Here, it came at the Israelites in the form of a giant force that they could not possibly defeat on their own. And maybe that's the voice of fear in your life. Some overwhelming obstacle in your way of serving God that you are afraid to even stand up against. Spoiler for the rest of the story. God was bigger than Goliath. And the Israelites should have trusted God to provide the victory in their circumstance. And, spoiler alert, God is bigger than whatever the giant is in your life. And you should trust him for the victory and step onto the battlefield. Maybe, maybe, maybe the voice of fear is a little different. Maybe in your eyes you don't have the skill or the ability to do what God says needs to be done. Again, trust God. He is bigger than than the giant. Don't be paralyzed by fear. In the Garden of Eden, the voice of fear whispered in Eve's ear that she couldn't trust God or the man God had given her as a partner. She feared trusting them, so she rejected God's way and in her panic decided that she had to watch out for herself, to decide for herself right and wrong. So often, we feel that we can't trust God or what his word says. Satan loves to get us to lose focus on God's nature and God's promises and instead look at the circumstances around us. That's what happened to Eve. Her eyes shifted from the sure word of God, that he would take care of her, that he would look after her, that his commands were for her good. And instead... She focused on her own thoughts and her own opinions. Well, that fruit looks good. It's good for getting knowledge. Maybe I can't trust God. And it happens that fast. Our eyes shift. We forget God's word, that it's for our good, all of it, even the parts we don't understand or agree with. And then we have to figure it out on our own. Oh, I, I, I like this part of God's word, so I'll keep that part. But this part of God's word, I don't, I don't really like that, so I'm going I'm to explain that away or I'm going to ignore it or I'll find teachers who tell me that I don't have to listen to that part so I can do what I want instead. That is the voice of fear. You can trust God. You can trust his word. You can trust all of it. Now that means letting go of your way and trusting his way, but we've seen over and over that his way is always better. And for many people, the voice of fear comes at them through past mistakes. Mistakes that I've made in the past or how I used to live that goes against the Bible, maybe even before I was a follower of Jesus. And then I get stuck because fear whispers in my ear 
that because of that, because of whatever that is, that I'm worthless or I'm tainted or that others can't possibly love me or respect me or care about me because of that. And often that fear leads that person to attempt to justify their past mistake. And if that happens, that person becomes crippled. Because if I am stuck justifying my past, saying that it wasn't bad or it wasn't that bad or it wasn't wrong or something like that, if I'm stuck there, I can never move past that into the present. The way to move past your past if you want to move your friends, the way to put your behind in the past, the way to put your past behind you, is not, like the Lion King told us, Hakuna Matata. It is not, no worries. The way to move past your past is forgiveness. The only freedom from your past is in God's forgiveness. But we can only experience his forgiveness when we admit that it was wrong and that we need to be forgiven. Then you can move on. But the voice of fear holds us back from doing that because can I really trust God to forgive me? Fear. God will forgive you. Don't give in to the voice of fear. And right alongside of that, I have to mention, is being afraid to forgive others? I say that because the thing that prevents us from forgiving other people is also fear. Fear that if I don't hold on to the offense, then I'm saying whatever they did was okay, or that it was okay for them to do, or that they don't have to be held accountable for it. Trust God. Let him take care of that. Let go of fear. And why do I say that the voice of fear, why do I make such a concrete statement that the voice of fear is always from the enemy? I say that because the voice of fear is never the voice of God. John tells us in 1 John chapter 4, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. God is love, and there is no fear in love. So, Fear does not come from God, but it is the tool of the enemy to pull us away from God. Why is there no fear in love? Because, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love always trusts. If we trust God, fear has no place. If you hear the voice of fear, it is always the enemy because there is no fear in love. And Satan comes at us through the voice of fear in so many ways, but his goal is always just like Goliath's. He wants to demoralize us with fear. He wants to cripple us in doing anything. He wants to leave us paralyzed, dismayed, and terrified. He wants to make us afraid of anything and everything he can. Fear of the odds against us. Fear of trusting God. Fear that I have to look out for myself. Fear that I can't be forgiven. Fear, that I, fear to forgive. Fear of my lack of ability. Whatever it is, he wants us to be afraid of it. And he uses the voice of fear to stop us before we even step on to the battlefield. Because he knows that if we do, he's done for. Because with God for us, even Satan cannot stand against us because there is no power in heaven or on the earth or under earth that does not bend to the will of our heavenly Father. There is no place for fear if you trust God. The Welsh Protestant minister Martin Lloyd-Jones said, 
that one of our main problems in the Christian life is that we spend too much time listening to ourselves and not enough time talking to ourselves. We listen to the voice of fear that Satan is whispering in our ear when what we should be doing is preaching the gospel to ourselves. Because perfect love drives out fear, and God is love. So challenge the voice of fear in your ear with the word of God. Speak the scripture to yourself out loud. And then trust God and step onto the battlefield and face that giant. Let's stand up and sing one last song together. And let's declare right here, right now, that fear has no sway on us. Because we know who it is that we serve. That he loves us. And that he is faithful. That he showed himself to be so. And that he will never stop being that. I am holding on to faith Cause I know you'll make a way I don't always understand I don't always get to see I will believe it I will believe it You make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise to shake prison walls I will speak to my fear I will preach to my doubt You were faithful then You'll be faithful now I am standing on your word Yes, I will believe it. You make mountains move. You make giants fall. You use songs of praise to shake prison walls. I will speak to my fear. I will preach to my doubts. You were faithful then. You'll be faithful now. You were faithful then. Thank you guys so much for joining us, for worshiping with us. Hope you have a great week. I love you guys.